So last day we talked about the cell membrane and what it's made up of and we talked about the key phrases that they use often to describe the cell membrane. Um, today we're going to spend a little more time talking about how materials get across the cell membrane, either into the cell or out of the cell. Um, we talked about how the cell membrane is selectively permeable, so it kind of um, controls what can enter and leave the cell. And part of that control is because of the fact that most of the cell membrane is hydrophobic. So that provides a boundary because, because um, not as many things are able to dissolve in things that are hydrophobic so that they have a harder time just passing through. So they might need some helper molecules like transport proteins or things like that to get them through. We're going to talk about some situations and how materials can pass across the membrane. So the two main types of transport, um, they can be, there's many, many different um, processes that work to transport materials across the membrane, but they're, they're grouped into two main categories or main types, and that's passive or active transport. So with passive transport, if you think if, if someone's being passive about something, then they're not really putting much effort or energy into it, just kind of let things happen. So with passive transport, um, there's no energy needed, so no ATP needed. And it generally happens where materials are moving down their concentration gradient. So that, that funny set of brackets just means concentration. So that means they go from an area where there's lots of it to where there's less of it. So if you, if you were um, thinking about riding a bicycle, it'd be like you're riding the bicycle downhill. Okay, going from a higher place to a lower place doesn't take much energy. The types that we're going to look at that fall into this category are diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. So we'll look at those ones in a little more detail afterwards. The other category of transport is active transport. Okay, so if it's more like riding the bicycle up the hill. So we're going against the natural tendency, so against the concentration gradient, trying to take things from where there's less of it to where there's more. And that requires energy in the form of ATP. So the kinds that we'll look at here are um, transport proteins that act through capture and release or pumps. We'll also look at processes of endocytosis and exocytosis, which are moving larger amounts or larger quantities of materials either into or out of the cell. Okay, so the first type of passive transport we're going to talk about is diffusion. Um, ten diffusion is really the tendency of uh, materials to move from an area of high concentration or pressure to an area of low concentration or pressure. So this diagram is kind of showing a simple version of it. So there's lots of the red dots on this side and less over here. So this is an area of higher concentration. And so they would move to try and spread out. The natural tendency of, of mole molecular movement is to, to bang against each other, but try and spread out within their container or wherever they're at. Um, when we talk about gases moving, then we tend to talk about them in terms of the difference in pressure because um, that's how they kind of measure the amount that's there. So, for instance, if um, molecules are small enough and they're not charged or they're hydrophobic, then they would generally be able to pass through the membrane from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration without any help. That's the case for oxygen. So oxygen will diffuse from our blood where there's lots of it into our tissues where there's less quite readily. And that's really important for us. And the opposite's too for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide builds up in our tissues as we break down food stuff. Um, so the carbon dioxide would be higher amounts in inside of your cells and less in the blood. So it'll move from, from inside the cell out into the blood so that we can carry it to our lungs and get rid of it. 
we'll show you a quick little video, or not video, but a little um, animation that kind of shows here's diffusion. So there's lots of this substance outside of the balloon. The balloon's kind of trying to represent a membrane, and there's less of it inside. So the big arrow is showing that the net movement would be from where there's lots of that material to where there's less. So if we played it, you can see that they're going to move. Most movement is going to be into the cell until you get about equal concentrations. So that was, oh, that was diffusion. Oh, dear. So in class, we did a little demonstration of diffusion where we had water in a beaker and we put some iodine in that water. So it went kind of a yellowish color. If you remember um, when we, we did the plant cells, then we used iodine in that case as well. Um, inside of a membrane, we put starch, cornstarch actually, um, so lots of starch. And the starch molecules, remember, they're made up of a whole bunch, like thousands of glucose molecules. So they're really large molecules, whereas iodine particles are really tiny. So the question was, does starch move out or does iodine move in? And what happens? Do they get together? If they get together, if you remember iodine, when we tested um, the potato cells, when we put the iodine on it, it reacted with the starch in order to make a blue-black color. So that's kind of what you'd be looking for. And uh, you can watch the, the video of that if you go to the class website or check out the link from Edmodo. See what happened. The second type of passive transport we're going to take a quick look at is facilitated diffusion. So with facilitated diffusion, it's, it's still diffusion, so it, it's passive, it's um, a type where it doesn't require energy, materials are going to move from where there's lots of it to where there's less, it's just that they can't get across the membrane without help. So they have a facilitator, which is usually a channel protein or a carrier protein that will help to move them across the membrane. So we're going to have a quick look at um, a carrier protein that, that helps to get glucose across the membrane. And we said how, you know, if you ate a meal, um, it, it triggers the release of insulin, which is a hormone, um, from your pancreas, and that hormone will go and it'll bind to the cells of your body and say, hey, there's glucose out there, but we need some um, helper proteins in the membrane to get it into the cells. So it's really important that, that this type of transport can happen so we can get energy in our cells. I'm just going to go back to get that link. So, with passive transport, this one is showing um, facilitated transport. Okay, so it's still passive, but it uses a helper protein in the membrane, and this is representing a glucose molecule. It's kind of a capture and release, but it doesn't require energy in this case. So it, it has to bind, it has to have the proper shape for it to bind to it. There'll be a conformational change in the protein, in other words, it changes its shape so that it can release it on the other side. And we'll watch a few of them in action. Oh. All right. So that was facilitated diffusion, where you still have them moving without energy from an area of high concentration, so on this side, to an area of low concentration, but they need a helper protein to get them across the membrane third type of passive transport we're going to take a look at is osmosis. And osmosis is really, it's a special case of diffusion, but it's diffusion of a certain substance, and that is water. So it's the movement of water from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. If you can probably, some of you may have seen it already, but there's a a cute cartoon called Osmosis Jones. It's a full movie and it kind of 
um, helps you to understand in a funny way about some of the processes in our bodies. So, um, so osmosis, this is showing um, a simple diagram of osmosis. So osmosis is when water moves from where there's lots of it to where there's less. And it can be a little confusing at times, so I tend to try and look at it either, okay, well, where is there lots of water? So that is going to leave and go to where there's less of it. Hmm. So the red dots here are representing water. So if you look, what side is there more water on? There's more red dots on this side and less blue. So the water would tend to move to the left, to where there's less water. And so if you were to watch the level in this um, setup, the level of the solution on the left should go up and the level on the solution on the right should go down when the water moves. Now another way you could think of it is, okay, well water is always trying to kind of balance the concentration of things. So it will tend to move from where there's more of it to where there's less, we know that, but you could also think of it in terms of it's going to move to where there's a lot more solute. So there's more solute over here. Water's going to try and move over to the left in order to kind of even out the concentrations. So that's the other way you could look at it. Here's a little video of osmosis. So. So that's just a simple visual for you. Mm. Now, <coughs> there are certain terms that we use to describe solutions relative to each other, um, and and they're. It's, it's really important to understand them, to understand why um, maybe certain organisms have certain features about them to deal with excess water or to deal with excess salts or um, basically to live in, in environments where maybe the, the level of, of solute around them isn't, it's either higher or lower than what's inside of them. So um, it's really important to understand these terms and to understand which way water would tend to move in order to try and balance things out. So um, tonicity is what we are talking about. And tonicity of solutions is really, it's terms we use to describe the relative amount of solute that's in the solutions. There are three terms, hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. So if you think of um, um, someone who is hyperactive, it means they have more energy than normal. So hyper, that prefix means more than normal. So hypertonic means has more solute than the one that you're referring to. Hypotonic, hypo means less. Hypoallergenic animal would be one that has less of a, an, an allergy causing uh, protein in it or, or whatever factor um, than another. So hypo means less. So it has less solute than the one ref being referred to. And isotonic means it has the same amount of solute. So if we were to look at these diagrams, okay, the number when it says like 0.2 m, the big M is standing for molarity, and that's a measure of concentration of solution, of how much solute is in the solution. So the higher the number, the more solute that's there. So if we were to take and, and look at this 
blow it up and, and look at how much solute is present. Okay, 0.2 molar has less solute in it than the 0.8 molar of the solution that's surrounding it. Okay, so there's a solution inside of the membrane and then the solution that's surrounding it. If you were to use the terms to describe them, then the one on the left has less solute than the one on the right, so we'd say it's hypotonic to it, so a hypotonic solution. But if we were talking about the one on the right compared to the one on the left, it would be hypertonic because it has more. Now if you were thinking about, okay, well, which way would water move? Remember, you can look at it as, okay, well, where is there more water and where is there less? So there's more water in the one that has less solute. So water would tend to go from where there's more of it to where there's less. So it's going to tend to go from the left to the right. You are correct. Okay, so it'll go from the left to the right. So that would make the number inside here, so the point 0.2, because some of the water is going to go out, it's going to become more concentrated, so it'll go higher. Whereas the one on the right, or the, the solution that's surrounding it, it's point 0.8 molar. Well, if you add more water to it, if the water comes out into it, then that point 0.8 is going to get lower. So it tries to even out the concentrations and bring them closer to being the same. The other way you can always look at it is water will move to where there's more solute. So the water will tend to move to where the higher number is. Where, so it would move out of the, the membrane into the solution in the beaker. Hmm, well if that happens, what happens, what, what do you think that the membrane is going to look like? Is it going to be the same size? Is it going to get bigger or is it going to get smaller? it's going to shrink. It's going to get smaller as the water moves out. So if you took it out and massed it or anything, it would get have less mass. Now the one on the right has 0.2 molar inside the membrane and 0.2 molar outside the membrane. So those are equal concentrations. So we say they are isotonic solutions. They have the same amount of solute in both. So you'd think, well, then there's no need for anything to move across the membrane. But in fact, water keeps moving, the molecules are always moving around, and so some of them will bang through and pass through the membrane, but some from the other side will move back. So it looks like nothing is really happening, but in fact, it's moving in both directions. So let's look at some more examples. Okay. So let's take a look at this one. This one has 0.5 molar inside the membrane and 0.2 mo molar out. So if I were to say, okay, I'm taking this cell and I'm putting it into a solution, the solution, because it has a lower number, lower concentration, that means it has less solute in it. So we would say it is hypotonic to what's inside the cell or inside the membrane. So... Which way would water move? You're right. Water's going to move from where there's more water or less solute to where there's less water, more solute. So it will move into the membrane and that membrane is going to expand. The one on the right, same concentrations. So again, it's isotonic. It looks like nothing's happening, but it's just a the water would move. Sometimes it'll move out and sometimes it'll move in, but they kind of balance balance each other. Oh, we don't need that. Now underneath, it's showing um, what kind of happens if cells are put into those types of solutions. So if an animal cell was put into a hypotonic solution, so let's say this is talking about, um, this is showing a red blood cell. So let's say um, you drank what we call distilled water. Distilled water has no, no minerals in it, no nothing in it. It's just plain water. Okay, so if we drank it, it would bathe our cells in, um, in a hypotonic or all-water solution. 
Okay, and remember water is going to go from where there's more of it to where there's less. So the water is going to move into the cell. And unfortunately, our cells can only expand so much. If too much goes in, then those cells could burst. Because there's no cell wall to put pressure back against it. That's the same kind of situation as if you had, say, a little paramecium. Do you remember the paramecium that we took a look at? Well, they tend to live in freshwater ponds. And the freshwater has less solute in it than what's inside of the paramecium. Okay, so for the paramecium, they're surrounded by a hypotonic solution all the time. So water keeps on going in. Hmm. Well, normally... It's an animal cell, so normally it would swell and burst. So how can they possibly live in the fresh water? They actually have tiny little baler parts. Okay, so they act kind of like balers. They're called contractile vacuoles, and they contract continuously to force the water out so that they don't burst. Okay. So that's if it's put into a hypotonic solution. So if it's in a hypotonic solution, it'd be just like being in this one on the left. So the water is going to move into them. What happens for a plant cell? Well, if the water moves into it, then that water puts more pressure against the cell wall. But it just makes it, it, it causes that turgor pressure. Do you remember turgor pressure? Makes it turgid. Tur yeah trigger pressure. So that's what keeps it standing up tall. If you water too much for too long though, they can be unhealthy plants. If it was an isotonic solution, then really you're not going to notice any difference. Um, but there's movement in and out of the cell. If instead though, was put into a hypertonic solution. Remember that means there's more solute around the outside of the cell. Then water is going to tend to move from inside the cell where there's more of it to outside the cell to try and balance that concentration. So if the water leaves the cell, then the cell is going to shrink. Okay. For a plant cell, the cell wall isn't going to change shape. But the plasma membrane is going to kind of pull in and pull away from, um, pull away from the cell wall. So the it, it kind of looks cool. Um, if it does it only a little bit, then the plant might wilt, and then as soon as you give it more water, then it'll be okay again. But it it's called flaccid when it's only partly like that. But if it goes to the extent where the cell is probably going to die, we call that plasmolysis. Okay, and that's what we looked at when we did the demo um, and added, we looked at the red onion cells in the onion skin and we added salt. So we put it in a hypertonic solution to see what happens. So you should really watch that little video. That's linked as well from the class notes page and also from Edmodo. So that covers all the passive types of transport. The last ones we're going to talk about are active transport. Okay, so active transport, just a reminder, it's active. That means that it's like riding a bike up a hill. You're taking material from where there's less of it to where there's more, and it requires energy. But can you turn it down just one or two notches, please? Mac? So the first type we're going to look at is capture and release. So it's similar to um, kind of what you saw with the, the glucose molecules. But in this case, you're trying to move materials from where there's less of it to where there's more of it. Um, so the protein uh, is going to bind a molecule that has a certain shape. Okay, so it won't bind this one and it won't bind this one, but it'll bind this one. It'll bind to it, but it requires energy and it changes its shape and releases it on the other side to where there's more of that substance. So it wouldn't naturally occur in that direction against the concentration gradient. So it takes energy. The second type we'll look at are pumps. 
So if you think of your water pump at home, um, the pump for it to work needs energy. We tend to plug them in. They have to have a source of energy for them to work. Okay, again, these pumps are working to try and um, put substances against their gradient. Um, the, a typical example is um, what happens with the sodium potassium pump, which is found in your nerve cells. Okay, so in order for your nerves to fire properly, we have to have a certain balance of sodium and potassium ions. And they, we need a whole lot of sodium on one side of the membrane and a whole lot of potassium on the other. So we're, we have to keep on pumping them so that um, we maintain those different concentration gradients. And then that causes um, kind of a, a, another gradient that allows the message to work, okay, it allows an impulse to be carried out and and for your nerves to be able to fire. If that balance isn't there, if they're not on the right sides in the right amounts, then our nerves wouldn't work right. So, um, I think I can show you a little video of it too. Basically, three sodiums are pumped out of the cell for every two potassiums that are pumped in. And the pump requires energy. That's why that ATP is there. So it establishes that proper gradient of ions so it will allow your nerves to fire. So I wouldn't expect you to show or explain that much detail about it, but you should have an idea um, what pumps are and the fact that they require energy and they take materials like ions and move them across against their gradient to set up um, set up uh, a certain situation so that your cells will do what's needed of them. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, a larger scale movement of substances. So um, endocytosis, if you think endo for enter, um, endocytosis is a process where materials or molecules that are too large to fit through the pores or channels that are in the membrane are moved from outside to inside. In other words, we're taking them into the cells. Now there's three types of endocytosis. The first is um, where you have solid particles, like for instance, if a white blood cell is going to um, engulf or, or take in a, a bacterial cell, then the cytoplasm in these regions is going to extend up and around and fuse in order to form a vacuole and bring it inside. Okay. Um, so it might be that it's an amoeba eating. That's what it's showing here, an amoeba eating, and it's extending its cytoplasm and its pseudopods around the food particle and bringing it in to make a food vacuole. That is phagocytosis, and phagocytosis really means cell eating. If it's liquid material or smaller molecules, then the cell will pinch inward, forming a similar kind of vacuole or vesicle, and we call that P 
pinocytosis. Think pino for pinch, um, but it means cell drinking, smaller amounts. The third type is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. And really, it just means that there's receptors on the outside of the cell membrane for whatever it is that's to be taken in. Um, an example would be cholesterol. That's how cholesterol is taken into your cells. So the cholesterol would bind to the receptors, and then a, a special coated uh, vesicle would form and bring that into the cell. So binding to the receptor triggers it being taken into the cell. So that is three types of endocytosis. Now the last type of active transport we're going to talk about is exocytosis. So think exo for exit. Um, it's where larger materials are going to be transported out of the cell. And you kind of saw this when you watched that kinesin molecule carry the vesicle to the, me to the membrane and allowed it to release its particles in the, in the inner life video. Um, so basically, a uh, vesicle with materials inside will make its way to the membrane, the cell membrane, fuses with it, and then releases the particles to the outside. So maybe it's, um, maybe it's transporting proteins like protein hormones or enzymes that have to go to elsewhere in the body. So it releases those materials out of the cell. Maybe it's for wastes. You're going to remove the wastes from the cell. Another example is release of neurotransmitters. So those are the chemicals that go between your nerve cells. So they're usually kept in vesicles inside of the end of a nerve cell. And they, when the time is, is right, they will move, the vesicles will move to the, the cell surface. Okay, so to the plasma membrane and it'll um, fuse with it and release the neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap. That space between nerve cells. So I'll show you a quick little animation. And these animations are linked right from the site, so I'm not sure that they're going to work right, but... Now, if you notice, when it brought the liquid in, it made it look like the cell membrane reaches out, but it actually pinches inward more so. So just make note of that. And if you notice, the membrane that surrounds that vesicle has become part of the cell membrane in the process. So that's endocytosis and exocytosis. They both require energy. They're both active types of transport. And therefore, larger materials or materials that cannot pass through the regular pores and channels that are in the membrane. So that is it for that section of... Um, chapter 2. We'll be moving on to talk about chapter 3, which deals with energy and photosynthesis and cell respiration. Just remember, if you have any questions anytime, just send me an email or direct message me in Edmodo. 
make an arrangement. We can get together at lunchtime or after school if you need some help.